Welcome back, nerds. Vino here. While Morgan's built a reputation on overwhelming firepower, her most insidious trick is actually a defensive one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Immortal team. Not to be confused with the LCS team, which, judging by the record, is absolutely not immortal. Now, you may find it a bit strange to have a berserker on something called the Immortal team, but it matters a lot less than you think. You can use this team against a lot of things, but it really excels against enemies with one-shot face cards and NP spam, things that would end your roster regardless of their class. Morgan's big contribution to this team is Roadless Camelot, her noble phantasm. Set aside all those cool damage tools and feast your eyes on the really important part, increased party-wide overcharge. Can you guys think of a servant that converts overcharge into eternal life? Enter Castoria. Around Caliber and grants a stack of anti-enforcement defense per level of overcharge. And for anyone unfamiliar, anti-enforcement defense is a kind of super invulnerability where it can't be bypassed with Invuln Pierce. If you can maintain these stacks, it doesn't matter what you're getting hit with. Whether a 20k crit or Arjuna Alter's Noble Phantasm, you can tank it. Abusing Castoria stacks isn't the most intuitive thing in the world. Odds are you've had to use around Caliber and Raw, in which case you just get one stack, and it's really hard to keep those for more than one or two turns. Once you hit the higher overcharges though, things really start scaling in your favor. Barring Noble Phantasms, each of your servants has a 1 in 3 chance of being hit by a given attack. Unless you get obliterated in the RNG department, this means you'll get a lot of mileage for 3 plus stacks per servant. Now, Morgan and Castoria both have batteries that can jumpstart the strategy, but when those are down, you'd be stuck trying to form arch chains or risk not having your next rotation. That's where your third servant comes in. Merlin gives you consistency thanks to Garden of Avalon. Its combination of recurring heals, charge, and stars makes it a lot easier to survive and face card your way to another round of Noble Phantasms. I like using Merlin as the second link in my MP chain because Garden of Avalon has star income tied to overcharge. Definitely less important than Castoria's stacks, but more consistently useful than Morgan's man attribute damage. This combined package has a ton of utility to get you off the ground. Skill-wise, you have everyone's batteries and offensive buffs, Merlin's invuln and crit chance reduction, and his hero creation can either spike up someone's health or let Morgan go in for a massive buster crit turn. Castoria's arts buff is also a targeted invuln to stop someone from getting zeroed out. Morgan's third skill acts as a backstop on account of its guts and a way to consistently convert your party stars into damage. It also has a recurring debuff to trim your opponent's teeth for a few turns and buy yourself time for your heals to do their work. Now, if you're wondering why I'm not using Merlin in my footage, because I don't have him. At least not on my JP account. Instead, I'm running Lady Avalon, and lucky for me, she's just Rule 63 Merlin with a largely overlapping kit. Actually, I prefer Proto Merlin aka Porin for a few reasons. The first is that Winds of Avalon has a charge regeneration effect tied to her NP level instead of being fixed like Merlin's. So if you go the extra mile, you'll have more consistent access to your NPs. Secondly, her Charisma variant grants overcharge, so in situations where your full chain isn't up, you can force the issue just using this effect and Castoria's NP. It lingers too, so if you pop it early, you can sit on the effect for two turns and come in on the third. Secondly, her invuln features a very interesting effect. It applies a charge prevention effect on all enemies, which stops them from gaining their end of turn charge tick. It also charges Purin based on the number of enemies, giving you even greater uptime on Winds of Avalon. There are two quirks you need to keep in mind though. First is that Purin is a pretender and not a caster like regular Merlin. Pretenders take reduced damage from alter egos and neutral damage from riders, giving them better survivability in those matchups. However, they take extra damage from foreigners and they deal reduced damage to non-berserker cavalry classes. In other words, her damage is worse against casters and especially assassins. Pretenders are like reverse alter egos, but this does mean they do extra damage versus the three knight classes, sabers, archers, and lancers. As for why I need to worry about Purin's offensive matchups, that brings us to quirk number two. Her hero creation equivalent buffs arts instead of buster. This obviously doesn't play as nicely with Morgan, but the crit buff attached to it is still very substantial. You can still have her push damage, but it might pay off to be vigilant and have Castoria or Perin herself cash in on damage if the opportunity presents itself. For some specific situations where you may find the Immortal team useful, Neurofest-style exhibition quests come to mind, especially the type that prevents you from running duplicate servants. The Immortal team consists of three distinct servants, so they aren't affected by this type of restriction. There are also a number of extremely high difficulty recollection quests released in the lead-up to Lost Belt 7. These include an absolutely brutal showdown against Arjuna Alter, where he comes at you with almost 4 million total health, divided amongst 3 health bars. And you're still forced to run Karna as a mandatory support. There's also a Canis battle where they'll massacre you with face guards. In both of these situations, you can just grind them out, using the Immortal team to nullify the explosive power of their basic attacks while still parrying their NPs. That said, your luck runs out in Lost Belt 6, which brings us to the Immortal team's biggest weakness, Buff Purges. Two of the Lost Belt 6 recollection quests feature buff removal, and this can make your life absolutely miserable. Not much you can do about it since these are fights that strongly encourage face racing. The one versus Morgan is especially funny to me since she ends up being the bane of her own strategy. The other is a pretty massive spoiler, so I'm not going to talk about it here. While it's not a tactical weakness, the Immortal team also takes forever to kill anything. You have a ton of non-damaging NPs used very frequently, and while you won't die, your damage per real life second is going to be quite low. You remember Jean Stalling? Think of it like that. 
you're the tortoise in the race. You might not get anywhere fast, but you'll win the race because the hare ate a 30k crit and blew up on turn 2. But it is one of those things where if you can reliably beat a fight with a more aggressive team, you should probably do that instead. Something we'll get to in the next video. If you missed my Morgan rolls, I have the highlights up on Fino and Friends, link on screen. And let me tell you, it's been a real roller coaster of emotions. If you're wondering where the Morgan guide is, you're looking at it. Well, a part of it. Doing things a little differently this time around, so stick around to see a different side of the Dark Queen. Till next time.